Okay, I mean, yeah. listen, whatever is convenient yeah. for you. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll make a start, I think. All right. Uh, Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we've got these podiums set up, but we've decided to have a more informal approach and just speak to you from here. Uh, my name is Simon Clark. I'm the program chair of political science and international affairs here at AUA. And it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce Michael Dukakis, who's going to speak to us. Uh, Mr. Dukakis was the uh, governor of the state of Massachusetts in, uh, in the US for two terms, once in the 1970s uh, 75 to 79, and then again from uh, 83 to 91. He was also the uh, Democrat uh, candidate, the D Democratic Party candidate for the presidential election in 1988 when he ran against George Bush the first, George Bush Senior, not not Junior. Uh, okay, so I'm going to keep uh, my introduction uh, brief because we're on a on a schedule, and I want to give. Uh, Mr. Dukakis, as much time as possible to speak to you. Uh, as you know, we're part of the way through the American primary uh, elections for the uh, presidential candidates. And so um, Michael is going to talk to us about some of the process, some of the uh, implications of the presidential elections. And he wants, he's going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then we will open up for questions and discussion. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Michael Dukakis. Thanks, Simon. Thank you all very much. Um, it's great uh, to be here. Uh, Kitty and I have just been here for, what, I can't remember, two days, three days, and it feels like we're on a campaign schedule, which is fine. Um, and um, Kitty's dad, there are a few of you from the Boston area, Kitty's dad was a remarkable guy. He was uh, the son of Ukrainian Jewish immigrants who grew up in Somerville, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston, and became a member of the first violin section of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and the associate conductor of the Boston Pops under a fellow named Arthur Fiedler, who was the founder of the Boston Pops. And uh, there was an Armenian night once a year at Symphony Hall where the Armenian community uh, sponsored the concert. And uh, the Pops concerts have always been sponsored and they're kind of fundraising events for the sponsors and so on and so forth. And I remember him very well working hard so that he could begin the evening by greeting his Armenian friends with Sidili Garimna Parigamner. Sidili Parigamner. I remember that. He worked very hard at that. Um, any Greek speakers in the room? Probably not. Kitty's dad was an amazing guy. and He had a great ear for languages. And when uh, his daughter fell in love with this Greek guy, he was really concerned. You know, we're very ethnically conscious in New England. And uh, said, Dukakis, Dukakis, what kind of a name is that? And Kitty said, well, he's Greek. Fortunately for me, his best friend in the Boston Symphony Orchestra was a second flutist named Jimmy Papoutsakis, who was an Al Alexandria, Egypt, Greek. And he said, well, Dukakis, Papoutsakis. Now, actually, if your name ends in A-K-I-S, typically you come from Crete. I mean, the overwhelming majority of Greeks with an AKS at the end of the name. My parents, uh, my grandparents were from Lesbos. And my father shared an experience which is very much a shared experience with people in this room and your families and, and uh, parents and grandparents. My dad's parents moved from a village in Lesbos to a predominantly Greek town of about 12,000 called Adramiti or Edramit in Turkish, which is very close to Smyrna. And so my dad was born and brought up in Asia Minor and left at the age of 15 to come to the United States. And that young man didn't speak a word of English, didn't have a nickel in his pocket, 12 years later graduated from Harvard Medical School and practiced medicine for 52 years across the street from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in a building which is now Burstein Hall where I have been teaching at Northeastern University for 25 years. It's interesting. Now there's somebody else here who's an old friend and I gotta tell you a story. When I was governor of Massachusetts um, 
I had no security. I wouldn't have it. I didn't want a lot of, you know, security folks around and driving around in a limousine and all this kind of stuff. And I'm a kind of a mass transit, public transportation fanatic. If you know anybody in the Boston area, I'll tell you that Dukakis spent a lot of time taking a public transportation system in a state of near collapse and turning it into what I think at the time was one of the best public transportation systems in the country. And uh, I used to take the Green Line to work from our home in Brookline to, to uh, Boston. And uh, at the end of the day, even if I was doing something in the evening, Kitty and I, from the time we were married, had two basic rules. One was dinner at home at 6 o'clock at night, and the other was no politics on Sunday, with three exceptions. The St. Patrick's Day parade in South Boston, Greek Independence Day, and combined Jewish philanthropy Super Sunday. Kitty's Jewish. And on those days, I took off Saturday. But I was a fanatic and stuff. And I was a fanatic about dinner at home. So typically, I would leave the State House at 5.30, walk down the hill through the Boston Common to the Park Street subway, take the Green Line home, have dinner, and then three or four nights a week, I'd be out. But I wanted that dinner hour for, my, for myself as well as my wife and kids. And uh, one father, when was it? I think it was a fairly maybe a spring spring afternoon, spring evening. About 5.30, I walked down and was on my way to the Park Street subway when I saw a familiar face and an old friend, Father Davidian, was on the sidewalk in front of the state house. Check me if I got the details. I think I, I got them all right. And I greeted him warmly. I mean, I'd been in his church. We'd been to events and so on and so forth. And uh, he said, let me introduce you to somebody. And it was a cousin... the brother of an Armenian priest, who I think had ended up in Germany after the genocide, was a pretty left-wing guy, and he was a communist. And, and he didn't like the United States at all. Couldn't stand the United States. So I, said, I came down and, and talked to Father Davidian, and he introduced me. There were, what, four or five people there, and so on, including this guy who introduced his whatever. And then uh, after we had a nice visit for five or ten minutes, uh, I headed down to the Park Street subway to go home. And I saw Father Davidian and subsequently he said, you know, you transformed that guy's opinion about the United States. He couldn't believe it that a governor of a state was walking by himself from the state house down to take public transportation and go home. And I hope he I permanently changed his attitude about the U.S., but I've told that story a million times. And here's Father Davidian. It's so good to see you. So good to see you. Um, in any event, um, you know, we have a shared experience, as all of you know. And uh, the Armenian community was extremely good to Mike Dukakis in Massachusetts, I can tell you. And I think a lot of it had to do with this shared experience that the Greek and Armenian communities have. And we have a lot of traits in common. We work hard, uh, care a lot about our kids, want them to do well. And both communities have done extremely well in the United States, extremely well. And uh, I know you're proud of that, and I'm proud of it. And there's been very much a bond. And beyond that, Kitty, who is not here because she's doing some mental health uh, speaking this afternoon, is deeply involved in mental health. Um, Kitty was the person on the original Holocaust Commission in the United States, which subsequently created the museum, who insisted that the Armenian Genocide be part of that museum. And it is today, thanks to my wife. And I'm very proud of that. And, of course, the Armenian community is very grateful to her, and uh, properly so. So we've had a long relationship with the Armenian community. In fact, um, Tufts University has a, 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 an annual lecture on this subject. And Kitty and I both spoke, and I spoke about what was a Greek genocide of sorts in some parts of Asia Minor. Not all. And my family was a part of that. Fortunately, uh, nobody was killed, but they were kicked out of the house, brought back, kicked out again, and so forth. And, and so we're all part of this shared experience, folks, and that's one of, the, one of the reasons why we're so proud to, and so happy to be here. Okay, let me talk a little bit about the um, 
current presidential campaign in the United States. And if you're confused, so are a lot of other people. Um, but let me say this, and, you know, I just celebrated my 82nd birthday. I feel 22, but I'm, I'm 82. So um, I have the benefit of, of long experience. Um, if you know anything about the history of the United States, we've had lots of campaigns that involve some interesting folks. Uh, there was a period about two weeks ago when uh, Trump and Cruz were exchanging very tough comments about each other's spouse. And uh, really going at it. Uh, I'm in the middle of a book about a, an interesting political character in Massachusetts history, political history, named Dan Coakley, who was probably one of the most corrupt people in Massachusetts politics, but it's an interesting story. And there's a description. He was very much involved in Massachusetts politics, held office, and a variety of other things. And there's a description of what Taft and Teddy Roosevelt were saying about each other in 1912. Believe me, <laughs> it was every bit of stuff is what these guys have been saying. I mean, very tough stuff. Um, but it's not as if we have not had uh, wild presidential campaigns in the past. And uh, nobody at this point really can predict what's going to happen. And as I often say these days, given what happened to me in 1988, and that's an election I should have won, um, I don't know any more about presidential policy, politics in the United States than any of you, to tell you the truth. I'm not an expert, needless to say. Um, but having gone through it, I think I can give you some sense of what's going on, and I think I've got a pretty good sense of what's happening. Um, for one thing, presidential campaigns in the United States are very long. I don't know how long your presidential campaigns are, but in most places, in many cases, by law, you can't be out campaigning more than four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, and so forth. Now, many of them are parliamentary systems, so in point of fact, the campaign never stops. But they are not permitted under their laws to go out and actively campaign. Um, I announced my campaign in early April of 1987. The campaign was in 1988. And I remember it well father because there was a late April snowstorm. There was about three inches of snow on the ground at Boston Common in front of the State House where I announced. And uh, I'll never forget my mother, a Greek immigrant herself. By the way, the first Greek American young woman ever to go away to college unescorted in the history of the United States. It's unheard of at the time. But thanks to an elementary school principal in Haverhill, Massachusetts, she not only stayed in high school and graduated, which itself was unusual, ended up going to Bates College and graduating in 1925 in, in Maine. And she was standing next to the Democratic minority leader in the New Hampshire legislature, who happened to be a guy named Chris Spiro, who came from a village fairly close to my mother's hometown, which is Larissa, or Larissa, in central Greece. And my mother turned to him and said, Risto, Chris, to lipasma tuftohu. In Greek, that means poor man's fertilizer. You know, late snowstorm fertilizes the crops. Um, in any event, I started my campaign the first week of April, 1987. And the New Jersey and California primaries are the last of the primaries, the first Tuesday in June. So I was campaigning hard and nonstop and running or trying to run my state at the same time. And I was very serious about doing that. I mean, if I had anything going for him, it was that I'd been a pretty successful governor, and the last thing in the world I needed was to neglect my job at home so that, you know, my governorship began coming apart. So I spent a lot of time. I mean, four days a week, I was in the state house. I'd go out nights. I'd, I'd work, uh, work very hard. And as you know, we have this very interesting process of state primaries or caucuses. A caucus is where all of the Democrats and all of the Republicans have to come to a particular place in the evening and stay there for two, three, four hours. Primary is a regular election, except that in most states you have to be registered as a Democrat to vote in the Democratic primary, Republican, Republican primary. Um, 
And the first two states, and this is just historically the way it works, the first two states are Iowa, which is a caucus state, and New Hampshire, which is a primary state. I spent 85 campaign days in the state of Iowa. I thought I'd have to spend 60. I spent 85. I was in every one of the 99 counties. Kitty was in 75 of them. Um, 85 campaign days in the state of Iowa. Now, you might say, well, this is kind of irrational. I mean, Iowa demographically is not a profile of the United States by any means. Why why start in Iowa? Well, because that's the way it developed historically. And if you go out and say, I'm going to get rid of this system and start with something else, you won't do very well in Iowa or New Hampshire. So nobody wants to run that risk. Um, I didn't win in Iowa, but I did quite well. I was kind of a close third to Dick Gephardt and Paul Simon, both of whom came from neighboring states, Simon from Illinois and Gephardt from Missouri. So I came out of that um, in fairly good shape. Of course, the question was, what do I say? Because the night of the first caucuses, you're being watched by more people on television nationally than at any time in your political career. And uh, a number of my top people were really disappointed. We wanted to finish second. This was third. It was a close third, but it wasn't second, and so on and so forth. Um, And finally, one of the folks said, well, um, it's an Olympic year, and it so happens that the presidential year is always the year of the Olympics. He said, you didn't win the gold, but you won the bronze. I said, thank you very much. And I went downstairs and the big smile on my face of about 500 people waiting for me downstairs in this hotel in Iowa. I said, uh, tonight we won the bronze. Next week, we win the gold. And the following week in New Hampshire, Kitty was putting a gold medal around my neck. So we kind of got off to a pretty good start. Um, and then you try to deal with this thing strategically. I mean, uh, it's a little difficult to try to figure out the strategy these days, particularly when you're looking at the Republican side of this thing. But... Um, in any event, uh, we wanted to do well at Super T- in Super Tuesday, and we wanted to win at the corners. We wanted to win Maryland, Florida, Texas, and the state of Washington to see if we couldn't. I couldn't demonstrate that I was a national candidate. I wasn't just a regional candidate, and I won all four of them. And uh, I had my best coordinators in those four states, and they'd been there for almost a year. My Maryland coordinator was a young woman named Wendy Sherman. What's she been doing lately? Tom, who was Wendy Sherman? Wendy Sherman was our chief negotiator in the Iraq in the Iranian nuclear talks. And went to the State Department with Madeleine Albright. And they met in my campaign. She's very capable. And if Hillary wins, I'm sure she'll be back in some capacity with Hillary Clinton. Um and then from that point, it's primary after primary after primary. And uh, I clinched that in New York. And I think probably Hillary has clinched the Democratic nomination in New York. Um, has Trump clinched it? Well, I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, but we've had a very interesting race on the Democratic side, a good race in my opinion. Um, Kitty and I happen to be supporting Hillary Clinton, but... Uh, I think Senator Sanders has really done very good work here, and I'm not being patronizing in saying this, in making Hillary a better candidate and making this a competitive race. I think it's very, very important that you just don't sail through the nominating process. And uh, and he's, he's sharpened the focus on issues. He's challenged her, forced her to to run a, a, a strong campaign, and, and so, um, well, I think she's on her way to the nomination. Um, I think it's been a good thing. The Republican side, and I speak as a Democrat, so obviously I'm not particularly sympathetic with those folks, but uh, the Republican side has been a little chaotic, to tell you the truth. And um, I'm going to try to make this objective, but feel free to debate this with me. I think one of the things that's happened to the Republican Party, folks, and in the United States is that it's become narrower and narrower and narrower philosophically. Um, one of the reasons that Trump drives 
the other Republicans crazy is because every once in a while Trump says things that Republicans aren't supposed to say anymore. Like uh, maybe Planned Parenthood does good things occasionally. Um, it's important that the United States finally, finally create a health care system which, in which every single American has decent and affordable health care. Now, Richard Nixon believed that once. In fact, the Nixon plan was a plan that I copied as governor of Massachusetts and, and got through my legislature to provide universal health care in Massachusetts. But for reasons I don't understand, uh, we've got um, a Republican Party that simply doesn't apparently buy into the notion that all Americans, and especially working Americans and their families, have decent, affordable health care. Because 80 to 85 percent of the uninsured people in the United States are working or members of working families. They're not sitting around. They're not on public assistance. If you're on welfare in the United States, you get Medicaid, which is a federal, state financed program. Um, but apparently, you can't do that either. And uh, every once in a while, Trump says these kinds of things, and it gets Republicans uh, upset. Now, it, this is unfortunate, I think, because I worked with many very good Republicans in Massachusetts across the country. And we shared a lot of the same values. We worked together on many things. Okay, maybe they were a little more conservative than I was. But I can tell you that the leaders in the environmental movement in my state were Republicans initially, not Democrats. One in particular, who was a superb person and a superb legislator. Um, they tended to be much more committed to civil liberties than Democrats were, at least in my state. Um, and I worked with them. And because when I first was elected to the Massachusetts legislature, my state was one of the three or four most corrupt states of the country. You know, I had a discussion yesterday with a group of students about corruption and what to do about it. Believe me, I became a legislator in a very corrupt state. Um, and we went to work and ended up doing something about it. But, um, but that was very much a bipartisan, a bunch of younger legislators, Republicans and Democrats alike, who just weren't, weren't willing to put up with this stuff and went to work and worked hard to clean the system up, and we were pretty successful in doing so. So, you know, I listened to a, a Cruz, for example, um, who, in my opinion, is just way out on the right-wing side of the political spectrum. Uh, I have to shake my head, because Ted Cruz is not the kind of Republican that I work with during my entire political career, and in many cases, very, very constructively. Um, in any event, for whatever reason, uh, the Republican Party's base, that is, the people that are most active in it, seem to have become increasingly conservative, with the exception of this guy, Trump, who, by the way, had very good things to say about me in 1988. If you want to go on YouTube, you'll see him saying, well, this guy Bush is okay, but I like this guy Mike Dukakis. I like what he's doing. That's, that was Trump, 1988. Um, I think Trump is going to get the nomination even though every establishment Republican around has been trying to stop him. Because if you get, even if, he do, even if you don't get an absolute majority, if he gets within 50 or 100 delegates, it's going to be extremely difficult to take this nomination away from him. So I'm assuming he's going to be the nominee. Now, having said that, and again, speaking as a Democrat, one of the things that I'm already urging my party to do is to take this election very, very seriously. Because done right, this could be a huge opportunity for the Democrats. But it's got to be done right. People say, well, Trump never can win. Anybody can win. You never know in these races. So what I'm saying to my fellow Democrats is, look, this is a great opportunity, but we've got to seize it and work at it. I want a 50-state campaign, 200,000 precincts. Precinct is the basic election unit, about 3,000 voters. I want us to recruit 200,000 precinct captains, each of whom recruit six block or neighborhood captains. And their job is to go out and make personal contact on an ongoing basis with every single voting household. And I mean it. No more red states, blue states, purple states. 
Forget about that stuff. I mean, I saw a poll a couple of weeks ago that said that if the election were held tomorrow, Hillary would beat Trump in Utah. If that's the case, then every state is in play, folks. And the Democratic Party would be nuts not to go out and work hard. But this is not going to fall into our lap. This is not going to be an automatic victory. Furthermore, it's not just the presidency we're talking about. We're talking about the Congress. Because I'm sure I don't have to tell you what's been happening with this divided kind of government. Democratic president, Republican Congress. Very few things are getting done. And uh, this is an opportunity not only to win the presidency for the Democrats, but to win the Congress, Senate, and House. So um, if one is a Democrat, it's pretty clear what we have to do, and that is to make it a 50-state campaign. Now, have we had an example of that recently? Yes. I don't know how many of you remember this, but after John Kerry, who, by the way, was my former lieutenant governor, after John Kerry was defeated for the presidency by Bush too in uh, 2004, the Democratic National Committee elected Howard Dean, the former governor of Vermont, to be the party chair. And Dean announced when he got the chairmanship that the 2006 campaign was going to be a 50-state campaign. A fellow named Ram Emanuel who at that time was in Congress, had been the President's Chief of Staff. Emmanuel said, Dean is nuts, ridiculous. You know, there are, there are 16 House seats, that's what we've got to be focusing on. Why are we giving, why would we be, be giving money to the Wyoming Democratic Party? Dean said this is going to be a 50-state campaign. And it was. And we won the Congress. And sets the stage for the Obama victory two years later. So, Governor Dean and I have been talking about this at some length, and I can tell you, as soon as I get back to the United States and to Massachusetts, I'm going to be talking to my old pal, the former governor of Arkansas, who happened to be the president of the United States, and who nominated me, by the way, at my request in Atlanta. Uh, it was a kind of a long speech, and got a little too long, and the delegates began getting impatient. And uh, when Clinton himself announced for the presidency Three years later, uh, he went on the Johnny Carson show, which was that late night, popular late night television show in the United States. And the first question Carson asked him was, so Why are you running? And he said, Because I want to finish my speech for Dukakis. Anyway, um, but we're old pals, and uh, I think he understands this organizational thing very well. And um, I'm going to see if Dean and I cannot begin working directly with him and making this a 50-state campaign. Now, what are the issues? Well, the differences between the parties these days are really pretty obvious. I remember back when I was an undergraduate at uh, Swarthmore, um, people bemoaned the fact that the parties didn't stand for anything in the United States because you had racist, conservative, southern whites who called themselves Democrats and root and toot and liberals from the North and West calling themselves Democrats, and you had liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans. And there was a fellow named Schatzschneider who uh, taught at Wesleyan University. And the Schatzschneider thesis, which he was developing and promulgating, was that the parties ought to stand for something, and they ought to, you know, you ought to know if you vote Democratic, you're going to get one result. If you vote Republican, you get another. And in point of fact, we have that now, and everybody's complaining about debt and gridlock, right? Well, that's what we got. Um, but... Um, that congressional, the congressional elections are extremely important, as I pointed out, and um, that's another reason why it seems to me if the Democrats have any brains, they're going to be working very hard on a 50-state campaign that emphasizes the Congress as well as... Now, issues? Well, you know, the fundamental issue that divides the parties in the United States uh, is pretty simple, and I think Republicans would agree with this. Democrats are more willing to use government to achieve certain social and economic goals than Republicans are. Now, like most general rules, there are some exceptions to that. But um, I think that's the basic principle that divides the parties. Um, on the international side of things, something's happening out there which is really very concerning, folks. Uh, and it isn't just about the parties. Um, I'm a fan of the presidents. 
I think he's done a very good job under very difficult circumstances, particularly given what he inherited. We had a terrible recession on our hands. We had all kinds of problems. Um, but I am increasingly unhappy with American foreign policy. Um, for example, I don't understand what we're doing in Syria. And if any of you do, let me know, will you? Because I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't know what, 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 are we, what, what are we trying to do? What were we trying to do? What were we thinking about? And uh, our intervention, along with the intervention of others, has now created a terrible humanitarian catastrophe. A terrible humanitarian catastrophe. Now, I don't know how many of you remember this, but when the Syrian thing began kind of getting a little angry and starting to get active, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, wisely asked Kofi Annan to come out of retirement. I don't know how many of you remember this. Nobody in the United States seems to. And be a UN mediator. Because he sensed that this was going to be trouble. And I'm a huge believer in internationalizing efforts to solve these problems. I think what happened with the Iranian nuclear agreement is exactly the way the system ought to work and exactly the role the United States ought to be playing in this kind of thing. Not running around the world, intervening here, and intervening there, and then in many cases causing a disaster. But working hard to get the United Nations and international institutions to step in as they did very effectively, it seemed to me, with the Iranian nuclear agreement, which was not easy, needless to say. So Kofi Annan came out of retirement, former Secretary General, and spent 11 months working hard to try to put together a process whereby we could begin to resolve what obviously were growing difficulties in Syria. And he invited 16 countries, including Syria and including Assad, who agreed to this, to a conference to be held in Istanbul, which would attempt to develop a plan for the gradual democratization of Syria. Now, one of the countries he invited was Iran, without whom, in my judgment, you can't have a settlement in Syria. We found out that Iran had been invited. What did the United States do? Any of you know? Basically said, if Iran's there, we're not going. Blew up the conference. Kofi Annan resigned two days later. And now we've got a humanitarian catastrophe on our hands, 400,000 dead, 12 million displaced. I don't have to tell you what's happening. The EU is threatened. I mean, f half a million refugees have landed on my Papua and Yaya's home island. That's Lesbos. Um, I think the United States has got to do better than that. I think we've got to focus on attempting to use international institutions to solve these problems. Um, we've got another incipient Cold War beginning, I'm sorry to say, in Asia. What about? Well, China. The United States is now surrounding China with military agreements with other countries. Why are we doing this? The U.S.-Chinese relationship is one of the most important in the world. China is going to be a prominent, active country. It's also got a lot of problems, which it's currently trying to wrestle with. Um, I don't know why they're spending money on a bunch of worthless islands in the South China Sea. But so far as I know, nobody's interfering with international navigation. Are they in the South China Sea? And China has a greater interest in free international navigation than almost any other country in the world because it's doing so much trade. I don't understand why my country seems to think that the answer to China is surrounding it with military agreements with other countries. Okay, so we'll continue to provide a guarantee to the Japanese and the South Koreans, and that's fine, but what's all this other stuff? And if, in point of fact, we think that China's activity in those worthless islands is a problem, then why do we go to the International Court of Justice with the Philippines and see if we can't make those institutions work? That's the whole point of this, folks, to try to develop international institutions which can solve these problems and increasingly, and I'm serious about this, make war an unacceptable form 
of national activity. I'm serious about this. And I think we can do that. We're closer to doing that than any time in the history of mankind. And I want my country to lead that effort, not to jump here, jump here, jump someplace else and end up with the kinds of results we're now seeing in, in Syria. So there are obvious differences of opinion when it comes to this kind of thing. On the other hand, uh, the difference between the Democratic approach to foreign policy and the Republican post policy is just massive. I mean, you've got a guy like Cruz talking about carpet bombing Syria. Where did we get the right to carpet bomb Syria? What is he talking about? You know, Father, I've often said he's proof positive that an Ivy League degree doesn't prove anything, right? Um, and that's, that's, that's not the half of it. Um, every one of these folks is for more tax cuts for the rich at a time when income inequality is an increasing problem, not just here, but in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and it's sad in a way. I mean, we want to spend $300 billion on a stealth bomber. $300 billion for 100 airplanes. Um, to do what? To attack whom? I don't think ISIS is worried about stealth bombers. Do you? I mean, they'll be by them before they even can see them. I mean, why are we doing this? What is this? Modernizing nuclear weapons. I thought we wanted to get rid of them. The Pentagon is now talking about spending a trillion dollars to miniaturize and modernize nuclear weapons. I don't understand this. I just don't. But in any event, looking at the two Democratic candidates and then looking at the foreign policy of their rivals on the other side. I mean, it's it's like night and day. I mean, uh, uh, all of those Republican candidates want to spend more defense. We're already spending more than the next six top military spending countries combined. And I thought we'd ended the Cold War about, what, 25, 30 years ago. So there are really differences there. And the stakes are very high, frankly. Um, but this is a very important political office, maybe the most important political office in the world. Uh, and my country has got a responsibility to go out there and I hope elect people that not only sensible and uh, can do the right thing and are people of great integrity, but also genuine internationalists who understand what kind of a world we're living in these days, where it's going, what we're doing, and the proper and, and, and the best role for the United States to play. And um, obviously I hope that whoever wins the presidency and the folks that are elected to Congress will reflect that point of view. Uh, we've got just several weeks more to go. Um, we've got a bunch of primaries coming up this coming Tuesday, Pennsylvania after that. Um, Indiana apparently is going to play some significant role on the Republican side. Then you have the two big ones at the end, first week in June, California and, and, and New Jersey. Um, and then, of course, there will be the whole question of the selection of running mates and that kind of thing. But uh, speaking as a Democrat, just to repeat, uh, I think it is extremely important that my party take this thing very seriously, not expect that just because it's Trump that it's going to be easy. It's never easy. And take advantage of what is an enormous opportunity to make some fundamental change in what goes on on the Congress side of the thing as well as the presidency. Let me stop at this point. I hope you've got lots of questions and uh, and maybe a few contributions of your own, and uh, I'll be happy to do everything I can to respond. So here we are. Thanks. Uh, we have questions. We have a microphone, but if you want to just speak loud, maybe we can hear you. Yeah. There's one, I think we have one down here. And there's one, oh yeah, there's one over there, so go to it. Thank you very much, sir, for your very interesting talk. I wanted to ask you if uh, you feel that today politics in the United States might perhaps be more efficient or perhaps even more representative with more than two major parties. It's a very good question. Would, would American politics be better 
I don't know about efficiency. I'm not sure politics ever is efficient. Would we have a better, better country, better government with, with more than two? Um, well, we've never had an opportunity to test that out. For some reason, historically, um, the United States doesn't seem to like third parties. They pop up from time to time. Remember Perot had a third party. I mean, we've had them from time to time, the Progressive Party back in, when Bob LaFollette was, was leading that effort. But for whatever reason, uh, we seem to stick with a two-party system. And uh, when there are third parties that get active and seem to have some popular appeal, one of the other of the major parties kind of absorbs them and their philosophy, and, and we're back to two parties. Um, I think there's something to be said for having a pretty clear choice between two rather than try to fill, fiddle around with three, four, or five. Um, and you don't have some of the problems that multi-party governments have. But um, historically, the U.S. seems to favor a two-party system. And uh, interestingly enough, as I pointed out at the beginning, we now have two parties that do have some pretty fundamental differences. So there's, there's real choice there, and you know what you're what you're getting for the most part. Um, but I don't see this, partly because of history and partly because of the country, I don't see us moving to a multi-party system. I just don't think it's going to happen. Who's next? Yeah. Of course, yes. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Uh, I've actually lived in Massachusetts for seven years. Where? Lynn. In Lynn? Lynn, Massachusetts, yeah. It's a great state. Um, uh, I have a question about Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Uh, I support him, but I'm a U.S. citizen, but I'll probably vote for him if I, if I lived in the U.S. And uh, what my question is, Bernie Sanders has a huge support among, among the youth Young and youth. independents. Yeah. Uh, and most, most Democrats see him as trustworthy and unlike Clinton. Um, if Clinton is a nominee of, of a Democratic Party, uh, will will the progressive base of a Democratic Party vote for her? Yes, but let me, you deserve more than that. Um, <laughs> let me begin by saying that my dear wife is not a fan of Sanders, because Sanders endorsed Jesse Jackson over me for President of the United States in 1988, and women never forget. <laughs> women never forget. So Kitty's not a fan of Sanders. Um, And remember, too, whether you're talking about the Republican side or the Democratic side, that we're only talking about a slice of the electorate. Um, okay, so in the recent primaries, Trump has been taking, what, 40, 45 percent of the Republican vote. Folks, that's 20 or 25 percent of the total electorate. And the same is true on the Democratic side. I mean, you don't want to plan the final election based on, on these kinds of numbers. Um, so you've got to watch that kind of thing. I mean, there's going to be there's a lot of people, a lot of independents that aren't voting, but will be voting in the final. And generally speaking, they're the ones that make the difference. And uh, when you're talking about independents on the Democratic side, you're talking about pretty liberal independents. Um, now, one of the interesting things about the campaign so far has been the enormous appeal of Trump to young people. There's just no question he's connected with young people on the Democratic side. Um, why? Because we went through the worst recession since the Great Depression. Um, and again, this is, let me just, and, and why the Republican candidates want to, want to do what got us into the recession in the first place is a mystery to me. And I say that not as a partisan. I mean, just, I don't understand it. Um, but it took its toll among young people. Not only that, but the cost of higher education in the United States is high and getting higher. And people are now borrowing to go to college, which is a phenomenon that my generation never experienced. I mean, I went to a small small Quaker school outside of Philadelphia. It's a good small college. Um, I paid $1,100 for room, board, and tuition, and you could make half of it in the summertime working. I knew of only one, I had only one friend that left college with any debt at all. I mean, it just wasn't 
anything we had to deal with. You picked up some scholarship assistance, your family's helped out, and so forth. 1100 bucks. I spent $1,000 in tuition to go to Harvard Law School in 1960. I graduated in 1960. One of my classmates was a guy named Scalia. Um, <laughs> even then, he was to the right of Marie Antoinette. He was a very conservative guy. Bright, but very conservative. Um, so this, this phenomenon of a lot of debt that these kids and their families are carrying around is pretty important. And I think one of the things that Sanders is connected with among young people is this idea that you know, you ought to be able to go to college and go to college for a pretty modest sum of money and, and not be loaded up with debt when you leave, which, you know, is really affecting young people in a lot of ways. Uh, but it is surprising. Now, if Hillary wins the nomination, one of her challenges and, and the party's challenges is to reach out to those kids and bring them in. And uh, as I said, I think the Sanders challenge has been good for Hillary Clinton in many ways sharpened her focus on issues, and so on. On the other hand, let me say this about this trust thing. There's an industry that has been based in Orlando, Florida, for the last three or four years, financed by extreme right-wing Republican money, whose sole purpose has been to tear that woman down. I mean, it's a documented fact. Read the New York Times. This is an industry. In fact, these folks actually ran ads against Hillary in the Iowa caucuses that sounded as if they were coming from the left, but in fact were being financed by right-wing money. I mean, that's what they're doing. And, and let me say this to you also, and, and I don't say this with any disrespect for Senator Sanders. I like the guy. But um, if Sanders were to win the nomination... You know, about seven billion dollars of right-wing money would just—they'd be take, bringing out his speeches, saying Castro was a great guy, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you can you can kind of see that up ahead. So, you know, those are the kinds of things you got to worry about in the final. And frankly, one of the big mistakes I made was, you know, ran a great primary campaign, wasn't ready for a final election, which is really quite different in many ways from the primary. Um, this email stuff—I know of nobody in Washington of any prominence, or even not so prominent, that doesn't have a private email. I mean, you know, I teach at UCLA in the wintertime, and, and I wanted to uh, get in touch with, with Secretary Moniz, who was the Secretary of Energy and was, in fact, our nuclear expert during the Iranian negotiations. Very good guy, Portuguese-American kid from Fall River who went to MIT and has done great things. I walked down to the hall to my friend Al Carnesale, the former chancellor of UCLA, who I first met at Harvard, and uh, said, how do I get a hold of Moniz? He said, give me five minutes, and he came back with Moniz's private email. I emailed him, and we, you know, did our business. Uh, everybody's a private email. Kerry had three of them. I mean, this is ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. Did he, did he do official work on his private email? Yes, they all do official work. Well, I mean, you know, if they're, if they're talking to me, is it official or unofficial? But it was... It was, it was department business. I mean, um, it was an interesting group of folks out in California who were trying to develop community-based alternative energy, and I wanted to get hold of Moniz and, and connect them. Is that official business? Yeah, it's official business. But uh, if I want to get a hold of my former lieutenant governor, I don't email him at, at uh, state.gov. You know, I mean, it's not going to get through, right? Um, everybody has private emails. Jeb Bush had four of them when he was governor because I didn't become governor and email time, so I didn't have to worry about this. Um, but the notion that, that, that there's something illegal about this is just, I think, ludicrous. Um, now, uh, she's got to deal with the issue of speaking fees and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan left the presidency and went to Japan for four days and made $2 million in speaking fees. I'm not defending that. I mean, I don't take those kinds of fees, and I wouldn't, because I want to continue to be a public advocate, and I don't. But she's got to do. She's got to explain that. Um, but I will say this: that um, that much of this stuff about her is really, in my opinion, nonsense. And in any event, you know, she's going to have to deal with it, and she wins the nomination, um, and deal with it effectively. I think she will, but 
this competition has been good for her. Shoot. Oh, thank you. Um, first, I just want to say that I was, even though I live in Armenia, I was born and raised in Massachusetts, so I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to you. Um, my question is about, you, you mentioned earlier the, the Republican base. And I, I just, um, I wanted to ask what you think about, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of Americans, um, in, including myself, I think we're very heartbroken over the fact that decade after decade, so many Americans are always voting against their own interest um, because they're caught up in these ridiculous cultural value, whatever family value issues. I'm just curious what your, yeah. It's a very good question. Why are working middle class Americans, especially white males for some reason, voting Republican? I think it's because my party has done a lousy job of connecting with them. Let me give you one example. Health care. Okay. The um, president comes in with a major health care bill. It's not everything that most of us would like. I'd love to have universal Medicare in the United States if I thought it could get through the Congress. But in any event, um, in he comes. And uh, this surprising opposition from the right develops. I think this was a democratic failure because one of the things you learn sometimes painfully in this political world is that, that message is important. How you articulate what you're trying to do is important. Um, and the fact of the matter is that 80 to 85 percent, I think I may have mentioned this, 80 to 85 percent of the uninsured people, the people without health insurance in the United States, are working or members of working families. Americans like people who work. They're not happy with people who are able-bodied and don't work. One of the most popular programs, maybe the most popular thing I did was governor, was to develop a program in which we were placing 15,000 single mothers on welfare in good jobs every year. And most of those women never went back to welfare, never went back to public assistance. It was a darn good program. And it was one of the most popular things. Republicans liked it, Democrats liked it, conservatives liked it, liberals liked it for obvious reasons. In the messaging that we used on the Affordable Care Act, nobody talked about the fact that these were overwhelmingly working families. They weren't sitting around. They weren't on public assistance. They were working. Some of them two or three jobs. No health insurance. And, of course, in the United States, if you get so sick that you can't stand up and you don't have health insurance, you end up in the... Emergency room at very high cost, which is paid for by everybody. Which is a very poor solution to this problem. If we had been emphasizing the fact that these are working Americans, working Americans without health insurance, because if you go out and take a poll tomorrow in the United States, folks, and ask Americans, the American people, should working Americans and their families have decent, affordable health care, what do you think the numbers look like? 93% say yes. And yet, that wasn't part of the message. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, this welfare to work thing. Working Americans like that. They're not, you know, they, they want to help people, but they want people, Clinton used to say it all the time, rights and responsibilities, right? You have a right to be assisted, but you've also got a responsibility to deal with this. And he and I and two other Republicans were the four governors in the country that put together this welfare to work thing, and it was extremely effective. Um, it's not that I don't think the social issues are important, but if if we want to connect with those folks out there who should be voting Democratic down the line, then you've got to connect with them in ways that respond to their real concerns, and uh, and I don't think we've done that very well. I really don't. Now, I used to get those folks in Massachusetts. Why? Well, I was in the cities all the time. We you know, worked very hard at this kind of stuff. But welfare to work was extremely popular among these folks. Health care for working folks, extremely popular. When I got my health care bill through the Massachusetts legislature, I must have had 200 press events. Every one of them had a working person or working family next to me talking about what it was like to try to survive without decent health insurance when you're out there working, trying to support yourself and your family. So I think, I think a lot of that is our fault. I really do. And, uh, and there's no inconsistency between that and dealing with some of these interesting social issues as well. I mean, we ought to be able to do both. And I think we're forgetting, uh, forgetting the importance of, of that 
that kind of connection and that kind of message. Who's next? Uh, thank you very much, Governor, for your very insightful talk, and it's a great privilege uh, having you here at AUA. Um, just I would like uh, not as much ask a question, but with your permission, uh, seeing how you are still involved uh, to the better of everybody in American politics, uh, just a comment. Because uh, teaching world history and studying different aspects for 40 years and being for the last 23 years in the United States, my single uh, general impression about the U.S. policy, specifically foreign policy, is that the American foreign policy does not uh, put enough weight on understanding the history of development of different countries. And uh, I welcome very much your approach that international institutions need to have much, much, much by far greater role. But uh, for example, <clears throat> when I'm thinking in terms of democratization and improvement of political situations, including specifically the Middle East, because we are in Armenia, we are naturally more concerned what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, when uh, I am, let's say, comparing the uh, British approach to the French approach, uh, I can see many, many differences. And uh, in many aspects, the French were more successful than the British. So there could be different approaches. And uh, the other big issue is that today still, in the Middle East, we are still much more entangled with and suffering from the consequences actually of the First World War more than uh, from the consequences of the Second. And it is very unfortunate that pretty much the United States took over itself the problems that were created first of all by the British, but also by the French and to some extent by the Russians. But what, why I, I want to emphasize here uh, just uh, very, very, very briefly is that uh, when uh, you uh, think about, let's say, how the French approached to Syria in, during the times of the French mandate, it was totally different than how the British approached. And first thing that what, Syria, uh, what the French did in Syria, which was, became much more peaceful than, let's say, Palestine under the French mandate, was that they created a number of different states in Syria. There was a separate Alevite state. There was one state based uh, on Aleppo, another state based on Damascus, a two smaller enclaves in the south. So what today we see is Syria. Under the French mandate, there was uh, four or five different uh, states plus uh, greater Lebanon. And why I'm bringing uh, this up, because um, the kind of uh, still this Wilsonian thinking of uh, exporting this very progressive, very democratic, uh, in theory very beautiful ideas that actually don't work. Probably that kind of uh, policies and politics need to change in order to make both the US foreign policy more successful and uh, the world a uh, much uh, happier place. Because uh, the place like, let's say we had all uh, well-formed nations like Egypt or Iran, it's totally one story, or this kind of, excuse me, I will, it will be a little bit more, maybe not politically very correct, but I'll say imaginary peoples like the Afghanis or the Iraqis or the Libyans, it's a totally, totally uh, different case. I don't disagree with you. and. Um... You know, we Greeks have a lot of sayings. So I'm going to teach you a little Greek today. Uh, one of my favorite Greek sayings is Pathima, Mathima. We tried that out with some of you guys yesterday, right? Can you all say that? Pathima, Mathima. Pathima, things happen. Mathima, you're supposed to learn from them. And that's why we study history, folks. Unfortunately, in the U.S., we study history, but we don't study it carefully enough. And um, 
I must say, when the president who I admire and support uttered those fateful words, Assad has got to go, I said, oh, God, don't tell me. And you remember what happened. It's very interesting. Uh, apparently, our complaint with Assad, among other things, was that he was using chemical weapons. And Kerry and Lavrov seemed to have a pretty good relationship and work pretty well together. And it must have been Lavrov who went to Putin and said, well, if we convince Assad to get rid of his chemical weapons, then we've solved America's problem, right? And in point of fact, didn't that happen? Yeah. And in fact, the United States participated in its removal. At which point, I thought the president would declare victory. Nope, right back in there, you know, with the CIA and the rest of it and Turkey and all this kind of stuff. Um, Mathima, Mathima. It's awfully important. And, um, you know, this Wilsonian idea that somehow we can spread democratic gold dust all over the place and, and things will happen. Um, maybe it's my age, and I haven't lost any of my idealism, as you can imagine, and so on. But, you know, China is not going to become a democracy overnight. Twenty years from now, I may not be around. A lot of you guys will be around. I think China will probably be more democratic. I don't know what that means. But right now, um, as I look at the scene, um, the present Chinese government is a hell of a lot better than Mao Zedong. Can we agree? People say to me, what do you think of Putin? And I say, well, i got some problems with Putin, but he's a lot better than Joe Stalin. Um, Iran. Why did we overthrow the democratically elected government of Iran in 1953, folks? I mean, why did we do that? It was so stupid. If we had not done that, in my opinion, Father, today Iran would be our closest friend in the Middle East. Iranians love Americans. Still do, by the way. I have friends who have gone over there, you know, Americans. Like, Why did we do that? Of course, we followed it with the overthrow of the democratically elected government of Guatemala in 1954, back when Latin America was almost entirely military dictatorships, and we were supporting all of them. As a matter of fact, any of you remember Fred Harris, the very liberal United States senator from Oklahoma? Interesting character. He's been teaching at the University of New Mexico for the last, I don't know, he's in his 80s. Harris used to say, all you needed in Latin America was a uniform and a pair of sunglasses, and if you told us you were anti-communist, we'd support you. And here was this ray of hope, you know, a democratic government in Guatemala. A guy named Arbanes was a progressive lieutenant colonel. We went down there, planted Soviet weapons. The whole thing was phony. We overthrew him. Why? Well, the United Fruit Company had a lot of, a lot of action down there, and we were kind of threatened by this thing. Um, studying history and then learning from it is just so important, folks. And a little bit of humility doesn't hurt either. I mean, I'm a proud American. I want my country to be deeply and actively involved in making this world a better place. But we've got to learn lessons from history, and we've got to understand that every place is not, you know, a laboratory for democracy tomorrow. And... Um, and that's why I'm so troubled about this, this, this China thing, surrounding China. Look, if the Chinese moved 60% of their Navy 50 miles off the west coast of the United States and began regular air surveillance of the United States, Washington would go crazy. That's what we're doing right now. That's what we're doing right now. What is this pivot? I don't want to go on a great length, but we, had, we were in Vietnam about three years ago, and the, the U.S. ambassador there was a very good guy, a career guy named David Shear. And I went in to see him, and, and I said, uh, let me ask you something. What is, the, what is this pivot to Asia all about? What is this pivot to Asia? I mean, as I'm looking at the world, I think the Middle East really has a lot more problems. What, what's this pivot to Asia? It's all about containing China. I don't get this. I don't understand it. You know, looking back, uh, it's, not, you know, it's not a perfect government. It's an authoritarian government. But um, it will evolve. And it's got problems, you know. China's got a lot of problems. And if we think they're doing something which violates international law, then for heaven's sakes, let's go to the International Court of Justice and get a ruling, right? Rather than surround them with the military and spend billions on this stuff. Father. 
At the risk of throwing a bombshell into the conversation, I want to know what effect will uh, the stands on the political parties on social issues such as homosexual rights and abortion will have, an, uh, what effect it will have on the election? It's a good question. We've had a very rapid evolution of uh, American thinking on these issues. Um, and it's happened very quickly in terms of issues like abortion, uh, same-sex marriage, this kind of thing. Um, and it's being driven a lot further by these young folks who have very different attitudes about things, very much, much, much more open and, and so on. And that includes the acceptance of differences, diversity, including ethnic and religious diversity. Um, we've got a flock of grandkids. One of them happens to be a, a, a very good tennis player in Denver, Colorado, happens to be the California high school doubles champion. And he and his father come to Longwood to play in the National Father and Sons Tournament. A few years ago, when they first came, Kitty was trying to explain to him that when she was his age, she couldn't step foot in the Longwood Cricket Club because she was a Jew. Couldn't understand it. What, 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 what difference would that make? I mean, why, why would, you know... Uh, I like that attitude. I mean, I like the fact that young people are accepting of, of differences. And I think, in many ways, uh, we're heading in that direction. Now, do I like all of these all of these things that are happening? No, I'm very concerned about this talk about the recreational use of marijuana. I'm not for prohibition. It doesn't work. But I think we ought to be treating marijuana the way we treat tobacco with, as a public health problem. To try to be limited, to be discouraged, to, to, to be treated, and so forth. It's an addicting drug. Um, I'm troubled about this kind of the recreational use of marijuana. It's not healthy. It's not a good thing. Um, and it's not something to be welcomed and applauded, it seems to me, even though we've stopped jailing people for using marijuana. So we're gonna, it's going to be interesting how this thing, how this thing evolves. Um, but I think it is being driven by young people who are much more open, much more tolerant, for better, for worse, and, and I think that's probably going to continue. Yeah, who's next? Uh, I have a question regarding your comment about how confused and unhappy you are with the current foreign policy of the United yeah. States. If you are un unhappy with the f current foreign policy of the United States, then why are you supporting Hillary Clinton considering her foreign policy, especially in Syria? Well, first, because there's a limited range of choice here. So you got to kind of look at what's out there and... And I don't say that disparagingly. You've got to kind of look at what you've got and then try to make the very best judgment you can. And secondly, she herself is changing her mind. Now, maybe not as rapidly as I would like to, but one of the things that happens when you get into a campaign is you can talk to that candidate. And believe me, I will, I'm not going to be shy about expressing my concerns about this interventionist stuff, which has been so disastrous. And she bought into it, as, by the way, did everybody, including... I hate to say it, Barack Obama. Otherwise, <laughs> what are we doing in Syria? Still buying into this notion that we can spread that magic democratic dust and transform societies without any sense of history or all the kind of stuff that you, that you talked about. Um, but as I look at the field, I think she's the best choice, and I will be doing everything I can with her and her husband and a lot of other people who I know to see if we can't change American foreign policy in, in, the, in the way that I've suggested, and I'm going to do everything I can to do that. But, um, but you don't get perfect candidates, you know, including the guy you're looking at. I mean, uh, we all have our our weaknesses and our flaws, and one of the things that getting involved in a campaign does help you do is to have a significant influence on, on that. So my hope is that we can 
convince her that some of these things are were mistaken. Indeed, indeed, isn't that interesting? You know, and the Cuban thing is, it was it was stupid in the first place, but um, you know, it's it's certainly a major achievement, it seems to me, on the part of Obama. By the way, you look at the Republican candidates; they're all against it, right? I mean, think about it: fifty years of this stuff, and uh, they're against it. So, you know, nobody's going to be perfect. And as I say, one of the things that those of us who are supporters have a responsibility to do is to see if we can't help our candidate to change policies that we think have been unsuccessful and to listen to folks who have much greater understanding of what's been going, around, going on around here for the last century or so. That's what, that's what this, I don't want to I'll wrap it up with this, that's why this Iranian thing was so, just so stupid. And uh, I don't know how many of you know the history of that, but I think most of you do. Look, the Iranian oil industry was majority owned by the British government. And while Winston Churchill had some 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 impressive qualities, one of them was not his worldview. I mean, he was an imperialist to the core, and he did not want to give up the billion dollars a year that the Brits were taking out of the Iranian oil industry. So he went to his friend Harry Truman and said, "Harry, I need your help in overthrowing this guy Mossadegh, who was no communist for God's sake. He was an aristocrat who went to the Sorbonne, but he was a nationalist." And he thought it was time that Iran owned its own oil industry. And if you know what Truman said to him, Winston, we're not going to do that. The United States government is not going to be involved in bringing back this kid at the time, this Shah. As soon as Eisenhower got elected, the Dulles boys took over, John Foster and Allen, one the Secretary of State, the other the head of the CIA, bingo, bango. Uh, Almost failed, but it succeeded, and Mossadegh was put under house arrest for the rest of his life, thanks to the United States of America. Disgraceful. Disgraceful, in my opinion. And we're paying the price, and have for a long time, because of that really stupid decision. Anyway, thank you for having us. This has been a great couple of days, and we look forward to spending the rest of the week with you. Thank you.